now I'm going to pass it to our uh, moderator here. Thank you so much for this presentation. Let's uh, welcome our guests. We have a very cool panel about the future of the internet, a people-powered internet that we might be building, hopefully. Um, I have a couple of questions for Tufi, if he's available, because I'm going to try to break the ice. Sure. Uh, so you told me before this uh, panel about the future of the internet that uh, you built several startups, eleven, right? Uh, oh, I built fifteen startups, eleven failures. So eleven failures. Uh, what's the most important thing that you've learned? Uh, don't be afraid to fail. There is no shame in failure. There is a shame in not trying. Thank you so much for this. So, um, let me introduce myself and our guests. My name is Andrada Fisudan. I'm a technology journalist. I mainly cover cybersecurity. I've written about hackers who drive Porsches, of course, about um, nation state malware, and also I did a piece about what is it like to be a scientist in North Korea, because I have a passion for North Korea, Cuba, and all these countries yeah, that are very cool. Just when I say that I fail 11 times, it sounds like a loser here on stage. I've had a few successes and I ended up at like Google, HP, and last one in Intel. The, the aggregate uh, value is created with micro founders today. They add up to about $29 billion in exits, so it sounds like uh, so I'm not a loser, but I'm not. Nobody will dare to say that. Thank you so much. Uh, so, I guess you've already met to me. Let me introduce um, our guests. And uh, let's give a round of applause to Mr. Satoshi. So, I hope you're excited. Mr. Satoshi is actually uh, Mr. Vali Bodiloyu, who has been doing work on blockchain for how many years? Well, he said 20 right now, but um, he did 10. Um, he's the CEO of Swazum. Maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about Swazum. His specialties include software architecture, software design, distributed systems and security. Vali believes in the concept of the right tool for the right job. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. So, for those of us who don't know what Swazum is, uh, maybe you could um, give a very brief introduction. Swazi is just another project, but has some particular things. Okay. Please, uh, could uh, you name two? Could you name one or two? Uh, yeah, uh, the great thing about Swazi is that uh, one of the greatest advantages is that it has its own network. Like, always talk about this with facts. In Swazi, we have our own control network that allows us to move blocks at a higher speed that we will move them to a regular piece of Very cool. Thank you. Um, we will move on to Mihai Alisie, co-founder of Ethereum, and Akasha, which is a social network. Uh, funny thing about him, he travels by train. And... Yeah. <laughs> He's from Sibiu, and uh, please don't call him a blockchain expert. Why? Um, well, um, I don't really like the term blockchain expert because the blockchain space as a whole is so early, let's say. And um, I feel that when you label things as a blockchain expert, someone that might come into this uh, field and you know might come up with a brilliant idea, because he might look at the problem from a different angle. Uh, might be stuck in thinking, oh, that guy is a blockchain expert and I'm not, so my opinion doesn't count. So I don't encourage that uh, idea of blockchain experts, and I think uh, at the moment, uh, not even Italy can smoke, uh, like uh, people which I, you know, in all the fairness, they are blockchain experts, but they don't call themselves that. So, I don't know. Nice uh, speaking of Italy, how did you two 
meet? Um, it was through the internet. Um, I started on Bitcoin somewhere in uh, the summer of 2011, and uh, at first, when I had like, this thing cannot be real. It sounds too good to be true, what's the catch? And then I started to look for more information. The Bitcoin Talk Forum was kind of the, the, the source. And one blog post here, one uh, article saying it's a Ponzi scheme on another website, and they, they defined my opinion. And then I saw the need for a coherent source of information, and then that's how I came up with the idea of creating Bitcoin Magazine. And, uh, you know, like uh, for a magazine, I, I, I don't consider myself like a writer or anything. But one of the first articles that I've read uh, when I was trying to build an opinion and figure out what's happening with this Bitcoin thing was written by Dick. And when I read when I read that, I was like, okay, now I get it. So uh, the name uh, stuck with me. It was one of the first interactions with uh, a very good source of information. And then I got in touch with him and he told me, you know, this is uh, an idea of Bitcoin magazine. Would you like to be part of it? And he answered, yes, sure. So, Cool. Yes. Thank you. So, from Sibiu, we're going to go to Sibiu. And uh, let me introduce you to Benjamin Mimi, yeah, Sibiu Mafia. Uh, Benjamin is the co founder and CEO of Adbond, a new blockchain architecture designed from scratch. Um, through Adbond, he attempts to accelerate the advent of an open, permissionless, interplanetary financial system. Sounds like Star Trek. Who are the Romulans? So, um, yeah, the idea with L1 is essentially that we want to create a blockchain that can scale globally, that can be used uh, not only in theory or in really good stories. And, and uh, this is why we designed L1 from scratch to optimize for really high throughput. Um, fast execution speed and negligible transaction cost. We think this makes sense in the real world. So, yeah. See you, Thank you so much. We're going to move to Florin Otto. Um, he's a blockchain enthusiast, experienced tech entrepreneur, and product manager with deep knowledge in building and managing multiple products across different companies and diverse teams. Florian built and managed blockchain products from ideation to the actual implementation, product launch, and ongoing management. And I asked him a funny thing about him, and he said that his colleagues are making fun of his new haircut, telling him that he's from a movie. Which one? Quite well, that. Uh, somehow I'm, I'm in black or I'm, I'm in product because I failed cast the Vikings. Okay. Sorry? <laughs> I wish. So, now that you know our guest today, let's talk about how we could fix the um, internet. So, the title of our panel is Will Decentralized Infrastructure Build a New Internet? with a question mark. And we usually joke about this. Um, in the media, we say that the number of items the story is with a question mark, the answer is no. Is this the case here? Um, do we actually stand a chance? Yes. Who would like? Would you like to uh, elaborate on that? Do so, you think we have a chance of being against the giants? So if I would make a suggestion, yes, I would please. change the question mark with an exclamation mark. Perfect. It's, I think it's already kind of happening, we're still early, but we see like, starting from uh, DNS, like a pretty basic form of Kindle that access a certain domain, um, from Ethereum becoming, uh, there are many initiatives in this space. We have DNS, Ethereum Next Service is one example, and uh, beyond this, I think it shouldn't be, I, I think we shouldn't focus only on blockchain when talking about like, decentralized infrastructure and so because there are many complementary technologies like for example like EFS, which stands for the interplanetary file system this time, right? And there are more Star Trek. Like, uh, IPFS also. It's IPFS, okay. And uh, uh, let's say if we would imagine uh, the current uh, infrastructure and the internet in the you know Star Trek scenario multi-planetary species, and now we have bases on the moon, bases on Mars, and, and uh, 
that is it. Uh, it would have a challenge when it comes to how we stay in sync. It's like, uh, if you look at the amount of time it takes to travel from Earth to the Mars, we would have a very difficult uh, uh, proposition when it comes to the people on Mars trying to collaborate. Something as basic as, I don't know, social network, trying to post things and collaborate on research. But things like IPFS, one example, would enable these people on, on Mars to stay real time connected and exchange data and similar to how we have technology where we really have certain uh, periods of time and between the sync with the data box, we would have periodical syncs between Earth and Mars. So that's one example in which I think the centralized infrastructure in this sense, as not centralized on Earth, could be an interesting value proposition. But this is kind of far fetched. Mm -hmm. yes. I, 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 I just would like to, to ask uh, if any of you would like to briefly explain what does the decentralized internet mean for those um, of us in the audience who would uh, actually keep ourselves updated with technology. So if you could just briefly two sentences explain what does decentralized internet mean? What does it mean? I'm going to give it a try. Many people say that the internet is already decentralized by design and they could not be totally uh, you know, wrong or right. It's, uh, it's a difficult one. And also decentralized is a very vague uh, word. But I think ultimately when we talk about decentralized internet, uh, it makes probably more sense to focus on some of the applications that people see as centralized. You know? So you have uh, everything from search engines like Google, that by the way search engines capability is very to solve in a decentralized context, then you have all kinds of services like streaming, that's, that's a more approachable one, and you already have uh, Peertube and a bunch of others deploying IPFS to distribute peer to peer. So, if I would try to describe how um, the, the shift, I would say that the infrastructure level is somewhat decentralized, but if we talk about the decentralization at the infrastructure level, I think that's going to be two steps ahead when we talk about mesh networks and actually a way to go or have like an alternative when things go wrong on this system, which is more centralized than the one which could be self healing self-organizing as we have blocks. So, yeah, that, that definitely one of two sentences. I, I, I just like to interject here. So, many of those applications that they're trying to utilize like IPFS for certain things like music and streaming or whatnot, I mean, uh, folks need to differentiate between the service layer and the dependency layer. The service layer, you're paying for that service. And you're paying for the service if the actual service provider is centralized and providing you with a better cost than the decentralized, you're not going to really care whether it's called decentralized or not centralized. Uh, the whole essence, the, the, the raison d'etre of decentralization is to reduce the cost because without centralization, you're going to consume a lot of effort to ensure that the value that you are transmitting is being authentic, nobody's replicating it, you're not having double spend, you're not having to break money out of thin air, you're not trying to do all kinds of stuff like that. So, that system works well in a centralized world that's extremely costly. If we were to truly be honest with ourselves that we want to decentralize this planet, we really need to focus on the net net cost. If we're not able to provide something that is more than 90% more efficient than the PP system, people will just use a centralized system. Can I just add something? So, uh, this is based on our experience, so we tried to build a fully decentralized social network and I think we might have been one of the first ones to combine it in with IPFS. And uh, in December 2016, we released Alpha, which was basically installed on the computer, on, on the user's machine, an Ethereum node, and IPFS node, so basically we didn't have servers, we had views. But the user experience was uh, Let's say uh, not uh, really. Latency? Yeah, not only latency, but you know, sometimes people post something and they expect it to be there for people to see it and then close their computer before the information is And then, you know, it's like you click on the image, maybe it's like just a preview, you load it into the network, and then there are no peers available. 
as I, that's not uh, kind of go mainstream. So more recently, one uh, you know, trying to be more practical, pragmatic, is like, okay, maybe we are still a few years uh, away from having a good and comparable user experience with the centralized services. So one approach, and uh, we, we, think, we are thinking about it, are okay. Uh, so on one side, you have the aspect of servers. But what if the servers are more like caching uh, uh, servers? not actually the source of truth. So, in one, one side we can have one IPFS, again, like an example, then you have watching, let's say IPFS for the sake of example, and in IPFS we have these hashes, okay? And on a server that uh, allows, like, for good user experience, you click on something, it opens, it works, it's fast, you can barely tell the difference between, you know, a centralized service and this, but if the, if the Operator of the servers is required by an authority or by, I don't know, the government to the head, delete this content. The operator will delete only the cache, a copy of the original file. And whoever has the hash will still be able to access the information from that PFS method. So, this is kind of a hybrid approach, uh, which I think in, in, the, in the next years might be the approach we will see more and more. So, just to add a bit on, on the initial question, I think the, the first question we need to, to answer uh, briefly and touch upon is what this decentralization is and why we're talking about decentralization is because of blockchain. And essentially, if you want to describe blockchain, you have the first uh, mechanism through which trans you can transfer ownership without the need for a trusted third party. Now, even if you forget and everything about decentralization, the idea is that once you have this mechanism and you have internet, then you can apply it on a planetary scale. It's only a matter of time until you have the necessary means of applying it, uh, namely a uh, blockchain that can really process stuff, that you can then um, like forget about many other issues that would require a trusted third party to authenticate your transfer and so forth. So there, this is the underlying discussion and then the discussion about uh, which behind discusses is the user experience. It might take a lot to fix this problem, but uh, until we, we can deal with the user experience problem, if we do not have an underlying technology that can be used, uh, then, then we have a much larger problem because we could fix user experience, but then nobody really uses it. So, if we understand this, then um, I think decentralization makes a lot of sense. I think we went away far away <laughs> from the subject. Yeah. The, thing, the thing is, uh, from my point of view, I think that we need to define the, um, the concept of the internet. Because some of us call it infrastructure, that's fair. Some of us call it DNS, okay, that's fair again, and things like that. But the thing is that if you ask the layman, the, the internet is the sum of what we find out, the sum of services. And that's what we try to decentralize, like the web. Right? I mean, that, that's most, I mean, that's what people get when. You're asking them what's the internet. Well, internet is Facebook, it's Google, it's, it's something, right? It's something that we find. It has a name. Exactly, it has a name. And the thing is that we want to decentralize those kind of services, right? And we see a lot of them. Um, it's funny, I try to use the social network <laughs> that we have in Spanish thing. I was curious about it. And the thing is that, to, to be frankly honest, we need technology that provides decentralization, but doesn't have a cost on how efficient it is, how fast it is, and things like that. And with IPFS, let's be honest, it's a great piece of technology, has a great concept behind it, but it's not really there. I mean, we're thinking about placing caching servers. Why not placing the content directly, and things like that. And the thing with IPFS, I, you use caching services, you can use them, but Let's be honest, I mean, most of the nodes still have the same thing because this is how our address works. And if you use smart contracts on Ethereum in order, I don't know, to post a 
picture or to store the address of the picture in order to, to give yeah, yeah, the hashes in order to give the experience. I mean, you need something predictable. You can't really rely on what might be in China, it's going to mine the hash that the block that your hash is in, in the smart contract in order to access it later. I mean, you really need to be sure. I mean, you need to be predictable. Because it's not nice for one picture to take, I don't know, five seconds and for, for the other time. I mean, you can't really rely on that, that experience. And I think that that's what we're lacking. We're lacking pieces of technology that are really more more the same with what we have today, but we said I see. There's another problem that I see with the current internet, the one that we're already crossing. Um, and this is privacy and surveillance, and you mentioned China before, you know, that they log different websites at the NS level, and so do um, other countries. Would the new um, internet that you're uh, talking about really address this issue um, as well? Would it be more privacy oriented or uh, will we be having less censorship in a uh, totally decentralized internet? Can you address this question to Tony? Yeah, I'll try to be sure because we, we spent a lot of time on the first question. So I would like to say just two things. First, I think it's important to understand why do we care about that? Why do we care about centralization? And until we understand that, we won't be able to point out where the current problems are. At the service level, at the infrastructure level, so that's, that's the first thing to that. Because once we understand, okay, we want to know more data. We want to um, be able to express freely, not, not, not be censored in many, many um, desires or functions that just got to be implemented. So if we go to the service level, as I mentioned, we go to the specific products that are currently quite uh, um, widespread today, like services like that we are using daily, like Facebook, Netflix, and others, and, and ask, okay, what does decentralization mean for Facebook or for Netflix? And why do we care about it? What decentralization enables us to do today that wasn't possible yesterday because, of, because Netflix is centralized? And um, on the other part, I would just like to mention that one product which I think was. Um, a huge, huge, huge um, provide a, a, a change in paradigm before blockchain. It's called BitTorrent, and it solved the biggest, one of the biggest problems in blockchain still today. So, uh, a system should be uh, thought in such a way that when users adopt the system, the system grows, expands, and becomes more scalable. Not like, sorry, but Ethereum, Ethereum was built by a cat, right? So, if I get this, yeah. So, that, that didn't scale, right? No offense, Ethereum is big. So, um, Vali, for example, took the BitTorrent part and implemented the product where you could just play the torrent, right? The craziest user experience in the world. We did the movie, search, rep, press play. That's it. So, I don't think you're User experience is a problem. I think user experience is a problem when you try to cram blockchain or decentralized stuff or bullshit into a product that doesn't need to be decentralized. So I don't think user experience is part. We already put it that it can be tackled, it can be solved. For sure, it may be harder than. For sure, it may be harder to cram a token, for example, into into a product just to say that. Right. So, yeah. Thank you. Bernard, just like agreeing so much with you, so thanks. I usually fight with people that's me, so this is great. Uh, no, uh, what, what you just talked about is basically that distinction between the service layer and the dependency layer. And uh, when we look deep into what folks are trying to resolve and build a decentralized on a service layer, it's just ridiculous. Like, just like do something else in life. Nobody's going to need your product or service if you are going to spend so much effort. It's going to cost a lot more than your competition. The intent of the technology is to reduce the cost. And so, thank you. Just agree with me. Yeah. Just one more. Yeah. Uh, I 
just want to uh, along the initial question again, uh, privacy and, and security. Surveillance. Uh, yeah, surveillance. I think um, many of the people, maybe even in this room, do not yet fully understand why this is a uh, main topic discussed usually. Um, and it's because of the fact that if we take Facebook, Facebook was a really interesting, smart startup with a bunch of people trying to create something useful. Uh, and it grew to a point where it is right now perhaps one of the most influential um, technology companies in the world and even more influential than any government in the world. And it has some really, really um, scary ways of understanding any of the people like each of us even better than we understand ourselves and with this they can basically influence decisions, ideas, uh, force of the world and, and I think within this context it becomes critical for us to have a way of communicating, of still having a, a network, a social network perhaps uh, where we can do all of this without having to control surveillance and uh, like censorship Part, uh, with which Facebook comes in. Because we're building technology for the good of the people, not for money. Okay. So, first of all, regarding the one of the things that decentralization brings into play, we have to this question in privacy. Snowden said that they're kind of uh, both sides of the same point. Right? Uh, I think if we look back, where you know, hundreds or even thousands of years, people have died on that for that their freedom. But we have now the freedom to talk, to communicate with each other, and not that one company being on top deciding if you can talk to someone is again kind of touching on that feeling of uh, us, freedom, and what it means for us as people. Okay? So this us here, you know, kind of scratch past it and trying to articulate what this thing is. In a way, we are participating in this modern, uh, better field for freedom. And this time, the medium is digital. It's a different approach. And now, speaking of surveillance, there is this, uh, actually, a couple of very good reports from Practice Labs. And I read something there that made me really sad for a few days, and now that I remember from them, Set for a couple of work. Uh, and you know, it's like they missed all half my comments on it. It's not only Facebook, it's like this is the current state of things. And the centralized aspect comes also is like when you try to access something and you see a picture of whatever your friend said, you're not actually communicating directly with your friend, you're communicating to these guys, which you know everything about them. And now, uh, an app that we install, you know everything from a flashlight to anything really kind of has. Oh, this application wants access to your contacts. This application wants access to your call list. This one's like, okay, this is just a pleasure. Why does it need my contacts? And then when I was reading this uh, study, I found out that just by having access to your contact list and your calls, you can successfully predict where you'll be within three meters, three meters, in 24 hours. Um, That's without having access to the message, the content, or what you want. Just who you call and who's in your agenda. So, it's like, this is super bad. I mean, if we continue on this path where you have the centralized services and we connect them and we are allowed to use their services, this cannot end uh, well for us, I think. Because too much power, absolute power, corrupts absolutely, right? So, in this case, they have way too much power, it's two billion people, almost, you know, soon, uh, I think we surpassed the half of them being interconnected by the internet, and half of them are using Facebook. So, this is a dark cloud, let's say. 100%, 100% uh, agree. I'm not sure how you guys got this panel, but usually, if you look historically, I've spoken on the events the last year, I don't agree with my panel, but I seem to agree a lot here. So, one thing that I want to add to what you just said is uh, the, what, what's happening in the world today uh, is the centralized AI 
Um, not in the buzzword. When, when I uh, founded the AI Centralized for ACM, ACM is a not for profit foundation, 100,000 members in computer science. I did my term there as a global chair and found something called AI Decentralized, and now I'm doing something similar for RGB. So, those are not, I'm not promoting something that you can, there's a token for money, whatnot. Those are actually I pay and I contribute, and people that are part of ACM do the same. So, uh, the, the initiative there is to bring blockchain uh, to AI, not AI to inside blockchain. So when I see a lot of people there, they just put AI in their smart contract or in their some uh, you know, uh, end wavy consensus algorithm that has some sort of AI. AI yeah, is probabilistic, so don't even think we're bringing AI to deterministic cryptography. It's the other way around that we need to do. So, why do we need to do this? Because AI is the future of next generation, and if we don't owe it to the next generation, each and every one of you is responsible for what you don't do if you don't do something about this, is you're going to witness for the first time in history that every single concept is going to be enslaved for reasons of what you just mentioned, because somebody decides not to like your children. And that person could be contributing today in the centralized control of AI and not realizing that they're actually entrapping future generations to come by having certain, you know, some committee to decide. Oh, well, now we decide that if we predict somebody is going to go to the restroom in five minutes, we need to shut down all the restrooms, we need to take them to jail, or we need to whatnot. And it's just like, it, it's ridiculous that the power of AI is uh, what everyone's going to depend on. And if we let that to be centralized, it's going to be abused a lot more than what they did for money. But if you've seen this much for money, AI is going to be abused a lot more. I have just one last question because we're running out of time actually. So quite we're not running out of time, they said we didn't have a commitment. So <laughs> A few days ago, I interviewed Paul Pixie, he's the DNS guy, and I had the pleasure to talk to him while he was traveling to Denmark by train, by train, to get his motorcycle. And, uh, no. <laughs> and um, what I wanted to ask him was, um, how does he feel about all the mistakes he made when uh, implementing uh, DNS, and uh, how does that time feels in retrospect? And one of the biggest mistakes that he made was not to be politely enough. He said that he regrets not being a nice enough guy to build around him a stronger community that would uh, have given him honest feedback and would encourage other people to uh, participate in building a more secure uh, internet. This is a new beginning for a second internet, um, if I may. What are the things that you would like to tell to uh, the blockchain community? You can go a bit philosophical, we don't know it. So, one of the things especially in 2017-2018, was uh, having a token. When you have a blockchain, there has to be a token. There has to be. Even if sometimes the token would not make too much sense. And many of the blockchain projects are used in, especially in this period, were born from white paper, but without having any prototype or anything to test the theory. So, if there is some checking to be ourselves also uh, can learn from is to balance the theory with also the possible practice and uh, this confirms some of the assumptions because uh, especially when you put money into the uh, picture, people are big, they come up with all sorts of crazy ways of gaming the system and that's not easy to come up with this uh, rock solid system and I'm not even sure if it's possible that right? like human ingenuity should not be uh, underestimated. So it's kind of probably like in games, you have this constant level of adjusting and leveling and trying to balance the, the game. 
So, in any case, the balancing should also follow an implementable theory and testing the assumption. Funny, if you have some advices for the blockchain community. To be honest, not advices. What's nice about blockchain right now is that there are several projects doing DNS, there are several projects doing storage, there are several projects doing gaming. And the great thing about it is that it's not just one guy. There are whole communities, and at the end of it, when the end will come, somebody will win. And they will win because they are better than the others. But we have multiple solutions to like that. Yeah, it's a bit chaotic. We have all these points, nobody knows what to do with them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, at a certain point in 2017, 18, if you had the Ethereum address, you would find some random tokens in your address. God knows why, what to do with them, but airdrops, yeah, airdrops, mm -hmm. total sense. Uh, and yeah, I don't know, I, I think, I think they shouldn't give up. At a certain point, all this big brother interface, I like it how it is. You know, like, for me, Facebook, it's an interface. So if I use Uber, the Uber corporation and their servers are an interface that I would like to get. I mean, I would like to see in my Uber app some kind of governance. Okay, I don't want to write this driver just by clean. He's hardly clean, or I don't know, if he's a nice dog, or anything like that. I would like to see some other type of mobs. Thank you. Benjamin? Sure. So, I think the most important thing at this point for the whole blockchain space would be to become more rigorous and whenever someone says something, claims something, uh, they should also be able to provide some proofs that they can do it. Um, as as I mentioned, it's very important to move from the white paper point to a testing point. When you test, you essentially discover that you validate, validate hypothesis. And the most important thing is not to start from the other people. It's always easy to point out and say, this should be done, that should be done. What we have done is, uh, we have come up with a, a technical paper of a very important breakthrough, I would say, in the blockchain space, but we have not stopped there. It took us more than one year to put this into uh, a really interesting test net, which is currently running uh, and exceeding uh, 10,000 transactions per second throughput at this point, and this is just the, the first testing version. So, uh, the, I think this is the most important thing we can do, each of us, just demand more and also bring more to the table. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So, I, I agree with what the three of just said. So, just to touch a bit about the point of what we have said, um, Ethereum created a money-making machine, right? Being decentralized right, was accessible to everyone. And it was widely used uh, by people trying to scam others to set their token and uh, provide no value in return. For sure, it was used by players who really wanted to make the product, but they didn't understand that when you go ICO, basically you are a tech company with a lot of startups which are problems created by the fact that you want to integrate the token, which has no reason to be there, right? And a, a bit more philosophical approach, or uh, yeah, approach regarding tokens. Tokens are a really, really dumb way to buy products or services. Right? And now there are thousands of, and thousands of tokens which are dumb, which don't work with each other. They didn't solve any problems. They were just a gateway to a specific product or service. And I think um, that was the case because it was so successful to everyone. So, um, as an advice would be to transition away from that and to try to uh, not cram or try to, yeah, to cram a token into a product just for the sake of uh, trying to raise money. And as Vali said, uh, at the end of the day, 40 years or 5 years or 10 years, exactly as a lot of companies were watched in the top one pool, um, they'll be watched as well, as we speak. So, yeah, it's, uh, it will uh, become, we need, we need a bit more, um, to be more rigorous when we say something, and we should treat uh, companies 
building space, uh, proper tech startups or, or proper tech companies, not, only, not the smart companies. Right? I saw, for example, a chain, I won't name it, it was a chain that I, I, was, I was having high hopes of. They were trying to, to tackle the interchangeability problem they, they set up, I think, years ago. And now I was so disappointed to see that they are treating themselves as a modern company in the way that they communicate, in the way they um, um, talk with their community, and in the way that they present their technology. And that's that. Just that. Thank you. Sure. sure. Um, so I highly recommend folks asking the right questions. Um, people get so confused between fees and costs, for example, and people they think running a certain thing or you pay this much gas and it's a lot of money. The gas is actually necessary for the system to run. The question you should be asking what is the true cost of that system? And when you find out that the cost is actually leaking from your community to a different group, you might be very upset to find the numbers. For example, the gas aggregate gas fees in 2018, 57 million dollars. What's the true cost? 3.4 billion dollars. So imagine you find a way to give it back to your community instead of extraction to a different group that they themselves own bankrupt data at the end of my single member. So asking the right questions. Who's making money every single time somebody is running a transaction? And if you don't find the details of who's making money, you might be shocked that whatever you want might be not losing. Thank you so much. So that was all for today, ladies and gentlemen. Please allow me to thank you to Fisalika.